Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Conacher Podcast channel. Episode 19, The Qin Dynasty Part 2. So hello once again, this is Dean Strachan reporting in from Beijing, where spring has definitely sprung. The temperature has shot up from about 5 degrees Celsius to around 25 now, and that temperature will keep climbing up to about 35 to 40 degrees over the summer. Now, I'm from Scotland, so you could imagine this is pretty much worse than torture for me. And speaking of that, I was unable to put up a post for the past couple of weeks, and I am very sorry about that. But there are two reasons why. The first is that I had a whole ton of work to do all at once, so I needed a week of a breather. The second reason is that midway through being what felt like being worked to death for a week, the sudden change in temperature really done me in and I got hit with a really bad cold. Trust me when I say I would have sounded like Gollum doing an episode last week. Now I remember thinking it would be a great and easy life being a high school teacher when I was still in uni. How wrong I was. But regardless, we are here now and things should run a little more smoothly from here on out. Sorry for the delays in episodes, but for now, on with the show. Last time, we looked into the conquest of Qin Shi Huang and how he unified China under his rule. And this time, we will look into what Qin Shi Huang does when he becomes, well, Qin Shi Huang. Now, if you go back to the time uh, of the Qin Dynasty and you are a member of the peasantry, I'm sorry to say, but life would have been totally miserable for you. Now just picture this for about two minutes. One day, you're working on your patch of land like you always did. You want to ensure that you can get a good harvest to feed you and your family. Not only that, you need to ensure that there is a little surplus so you can sell some of this at the local food market, not to mention paying your taxes as well. A few days have passed by and things are, well, looking rather grim. Your crops aren't producing enough food. And to make things worse, an imperial inspection is due any day now. Anxiety builds up within your soul, as you know that failure to pay your taxes can either mean getting your nose cut off, getting your leg cut off, execution, or being forced into the labour corps, where you need to build the wall that will keep the Xiongnu away from the civilised world. Being worked to death and being buried underneath the wall? That's even worse than a public execution. The Imperial Inspectors have arrived, and before you can even begin to resist, you have been drafted into the Labour Corps to build the wall. You desperately try to see your family off one more time, but as soon as it looked like you might even delay the expedition, the Inspector whips you and throws you in line with the undesirables of society. Those people are the worst of the worst. Thieves, rapists and murderers are in the line with you and they are all tied to their baggage train. The guards bark at you to get chained up with them. And with that, off you go, along the road in a painstaking journey. You barely get enough time to rest as the guards whip you for holding up the line. Now, as you travel north, you feel the weather change considerably as things begin to really cool down. And within three months of a very long, brutal, horrible march, you're finally at your destination. Half of the people didn't even make it and died by the roadside. If only you were one of those people, right? But unfortunately for you, the real work is about to begin, as you need to haul bricks, ladders and other heavy materials up the sides of hills, mountains or around rivers to ensure the wall can be built in the freezing cold of the winter. The rations that you are given are supposed to be porridge, but it's mostly hot water with the odd piece of grain in it, with maybe one herb leaf. As the months go by, any meat that was on your bones has withered away, and you are literally a shell of your old self. If only you could either escape, through death, or through a real life escape. Any friends you may have had have all perished to the harsh climate and the treatment of the guards. And it seems like it's only a matter of days before your time is up as well. And indeed, you wake up with a terrible fever. 
The cold begins to swallow you, and before you know it, you have died. Now, what do the guards do with your cold, withered body? Well, they throw you under the very bricks that you were building, and there you have the Great Wall. That there, my friends, is one of the many legacies of Qin Shi Huang, from when he became the first emperor of China in 221 BC. Qin Shi Huang may have ruled for only 14 years, but man, when he did, he changed pretty much everything in China. Think of it, even the word Qin, it kinda sounds like China, right? And that's exactly where it comes from. You have Qin Shi Huang to thank for that. Now the thing is, Qin Shi Huang is a rather controversial figure. Because on the one hand, he set up what could be called the Chinese culture that we know today, but on the other hand, he did this through absolutely brutal methods, like the story I just read to you demonstrates. But this is what's great about studying history and what makes it interesting. People like this guy. So anyway, he was now the first emperor. What happened next? Well, the first thing that he needed to do was really centralise his power. Because remember, he's just knocked off all of these warring states who have been fighting for hundreds of years. But now, there's only one supreme ruler. And that was it. Now, in order to unite what was once divided, the emperor wanted to create a single identity. And that way, he believed he could run the dynasty forever. Yes, he believed in immortality. And yes, I will get into it later. But back to the single identity thing. It basically meant one people, one philosophy, one emperor. To make this reality, Qin Shi Huang went through a huge process of standardization within his empire. The reasons as to why he standardizes everything was twofold. The first is that it eliminates the different cultures that were developing during the Warren States period and therefore eliminates future resistance in time. The second was more for logistical purposes. Now to grasp and understand them, we need to head back to the spring and autumn or the Warren States period. Because during this time, when China was going through this period of fragmentation, it wasn't just political, it was also cultural as well. This meant that there were different ways of doing things. If you were to cross over from one state to the other, and if you were lucky enough to have a carriage with you, you need to change carriages at the border as the width standards for the roads would be different. If you were crossing the border again, you would need to use different currencies for money also. You would need a different measuring system for the goods you were bringing across. The people in the different regions would also speak a different dialect, but so much so, it would be like a totally different language from yours. The writing you would see would be completely different as well. It would look kinda similar, but different at the same time. But now, with the victory of Qin Shi Huang and the establishment of the Qin Dynasty, the new emperor wanted to make sure his empire ran smoothly. So all of these different customs, rules, traditions, measuring systems, road systems, all had to be standardised into Qin's traditions and Qin's traditions alone. This process of standardisation was fairly intense and was put into immediate effect pretty much as soon as every state was conquered. Now, it wasn't as if each state would go down quietly and just accept all of these changes in rules, so to ensure rebellions would be at a minimum, it was rather ingenious what Qin Shi Huang came up with. So he confiscated all weapons used by soldiers in the previous warring states. He then melted them down and then turned them into currency for his empire. This had two effects. The first was that there was more money for the imperial treasury, and the second was that nobody had any weapons to rebel with. As well as that, he then passed a law which only permitted government officials to have weapons in the first place. So basically, there would be no unlicensed weapons within the empire. If you got caught with an unlicensed weapon, well, you might as well kiss your life goodbye in the most brutal way possible, because that's exactly what would have happened. As well as this, the emperor actually spent a lot of time touring the country and ensuring the population was submitting to his rule. He would travel to every corner of his empire to ensure any rebellions could be dealt with quickly and efficiently. 
But that wasn't the only reason why he travelled all across the realm. He also wanted to improve the road systems within his empire. And again, this makes sense. It means goods can be transported quickly, as well as the imperial armies. And of course, there was that constant quest for immortality. But for the most part, Qin Shi Huang wanted to make sure his empire ran smoothly. Which was a stark contrast from his son, by the way, who made a complete mess of it. But again, we'll get more on to his son in the next episode. So, I know I mentioned the story kinda demonstrating how life was for your average Joe, but I thought I'd better mention it again, just to emphasise how bad things were for Mr. Average Joe. A Chinese source which said the following, which I have very roughly translated by the way, and by me, I mean Google Translate, said this. Don't even think about good clothes. All the people at the bottom of the Qin state were parched or they can't even wear clothes. They just used cloth to cover up their private parts. There were no holidays at all. Endless work can be exchanged for the opportunity to turn over military service, and at the same time, a lot of taxes had to be paid. Many people were exhausted on the road towards extremely hard labour projects, such as the projects to build palaces for the emperor, building roads, and of course, what would later be called the Great Wall of China. That's the end of the quote. The original wall, by the way, does exist in some areas in China. However, the wall that you see on the Visit China magazine covers or on your Instagram and Facebook news feeds will be the wall constructed by the Ming Dynasty over 1000 years later. But to further emphasize just how cruel Qin's way of governing was for the ordinary people, I found this from the Cambridge Illustrated History of China by Patricia Buckley Ibre which says, and I quote, Ordinary people also suffered harsh treatment. Reporting crimes was rewarded, and the lawbreakers once convicted were punished severely by execution, hard labour, or mutilation, ranging from cutting off the whiskers to the nose or the left foot. Even perfectly law-abiding people were subject to onerous labour service, and both constrict Conscripted and penal labour were used for the building of palaces, roads, canals, imperial tombs and fortifications, like walls and fortresses. Several hundred thousand subjects were conscripted to build a huge new palace complex in 212 BC. Even more were drafted to construct the Great Wall." End quote, by the way. So I think those two sources really just drive home that point that Qin Shi Huang was a tyrant who instituted a police state in ancient China. Now despite the cruelty, Qin Shi Huang was starting to really put all of these just disjointed pieces together, centralising power, standardising everything, and even trying to eliminate any philosophical rivals too. Which brings me on to my next point. Being a die-hard legalist, other texts from the other 100 schools of thought, such as Confucianism, Taoism, Mohism, and all the rest, simply couldn't be tolerated. And this is where I finally found a source from the grand historian himself, Sima Qian, who wrote about the history of China during the Western Han. He reported the following from Qin Shi Huang himself. Quote, Historians hold it a mark of fame to defy the ruler, regard it as lofty to take a distant in stance, and they lead the lesser officials in fabricating slander. If behaviour such as this is not prohibited, then in upper circles the authority of the ruler will be compromised, and in lower ones cliques will form. Therefore, it should be prohibited. I therefore request that all records of the historians other than those of the state of Qin be burned. With the exception of the academicans, whose duty is to possess them, if there are persons anywhere in the empire who have in their possession copies of Zhou texts, or texts from the hundred schools of philosophy, they shall in all cases deliver them to the governor of his commandant for burning. Anyone who ventures to discuss the odes or documents shall be executed in the marketplace. Anyone who uses antiquity to criticise the present shall be executed along with his family." End quote. So in case you didn't get much from the rhetoric, 
It basically means all books other than legalist ones shall be brought in by the stage, which will then be burned. Now this, to be fair, is basically what happened. However, not everyone conformed to the new imperial edict, and when Qin Shi Huang found out about this, as you could imagine, he was livid. And he ordered that all homes of scholars throughout the empire be searched, and if they found books that didn't suit the emperor, they would then be arrested. All of these scholars, around 490 in total, were then buried alive in a giant pit. Talk about a brutal way to go. Now of course there isn't any physical evidence, as in no tomb of 490 poor souls, and as well as that there doesn't seem to be a record of it in the Qin records, apart from Sima Qian himself. This has led to some people believing that it is just purely slander on Sima Qian's part. Being a Confucian and all, it kinda makes sense. However, I am inclined to believe Sima Qian on this one. If you are willing to subjugate an entire population to almost slavery and through labour which is pretty much a death sentence, then you would be willing to bury 490 people who didn't necessarily agree with you alive. So like I said before, Qin Shi Huang was really beginning to mould China into one nation with only one political system, one emperor and one philosophy. The problem he had was with the emperor part. He knew that his time would come to an end like every mortal man. But the emperor believed that he shouldn't meet this fate. And why should he? He had unified all under heaven. He had created this nation. Why should he just die? And so, obsessions with immortality creeped into his mind, and not to mention the very numerous assassination attempts on his life led him to think that it was his mission to live forever. Now, according to Sima Qian once again, his advisors often tried to find herbs of immortality, which would increase his lifespan indefinitely. And on the road, he would travel and meet up with these immortals, Men who apparently were magic and asked them to find the elixir of life. If they returned with a potion, the emperor would reward them handsomely. So you know that when the emperor's carriage came by, just give him a disgusting tasting soup and you will be rewarded. In a fatal twist of irony, it was one of these elixirs of life that would actually kill the emperor in 210 BC. And it is suspected that it was mercury poisoning that finally did him in. Now as much as the Emperor believed he would live forever, he was no dummy, and he prepared an elaborate tomb for himself, you know, just in case he doesn't live forever. That tomb, which was only rumoured to have existed, was discovered by two Chinese farmers 2000 years ago under the leadership of Mao, by the way, in Shanxi province, just outside the modern day city of Xi'an. This is of course the Terracotta Warriors, a massive project which is basically an army that protects the Emperor in the afterlife. All of these clay warriors have a different appearance as they were handcrafted by over 7,000 labour conscripts for the Emperor. And it isn't just warriors or infantry that is guarding the Emperor's tomb, but cavalry and chariots as well. It truly is a spectacular sight to behold, and if China is on your list of places to visit, be sure to stop by Xi'an. It truly is a historical marvel, not just for the Terracotta Warriors, but for Xi'an traditions in place by the Tang Dynasty too. The tomb was actually incomplete when the Emperor met his untimely death, so it was up to his son, who we will look into next week, that was in charge of making sure it was completed and then he could kick his father's corpse into it. And to be fair to the incompetent son, he did do this, but then he buried all the crafters alive with the Emperor in his tomb as well, in order to safeguard his location. It was also Qin Shi Huang's son who placed booby traps around the Emperor's tomb to ensure nobody could go robbing his grave later on. By the way, this happened a lot in ancient China, where grave robbers would simply dig up some old king's grave and try and steal all the gold or whatever was in it and try and sell it to make some money. But uh, yeah, anyway, back to this. So, to be fair, nobody has opened the tomb even today 
And it's purely because of fear of the kind of booby trap that they're going to actually unleash. So it might kill everyone around them or, you know, it might ruin all of the contents inside it. So it's just been left in peace. And that's that. So to sum up, Qin Shi Huang was a cruel tyrant of an emperor. But, and this is a big but, without Qin Shi Huang and his dynasty, there would be no China that we see today. Despite being the dynasty that would last for 10,000 generations, like Qin Shi Huang put it, it barely even lasted one, collapsing straight after the emperor's death. So next week, the episode will more than likely be a little shorter, as we will look into what happens immediately after Qin Shi Huang pops his clogs, and how his son foolishly hands all of his power over to a conniving eunuch called Zhao Gao, who single-handedly pretty much ruins the dynasty. However, more on that next week. Now I hope you've enjoyed this episode. This is Dean Strachan, aka The Chronicler, signing off in Beijing. I hope you all have a lovely day and take care wherever you might be in the world. Thanks for listening. <laughs>